Toronto, we've got Puerto Rico, we've got Oregon, Austin, Chicago, Hayward. If you're just arriving, feel free to throw your location and uh, name into the chat. You're also welcome to add your company and we'll get started in just a moment. Okay, cool. Um, I think we'll have a, a few more folks joining in shortly, but want to go ahead and get us started. So welcome everybody. My name is Lisa Curtis. I'm the founder and CEO of Cooley Cooley and so excited for this panel today. Uh, happy Earth Day. And I think, you know, when I think about Earth Day, I think a lot about what are the ways we can all make changes big and small. And we know that one of the changes we can make is by buying more sustainable products. And so I, I'm really honored today to uh, sharing this stage with some incredible business leaders who really managed to scale up their sustainable businesses in an awesome way. So you're going to be hearing from them in just a moment. But first, I'd like to introduce our incredible moderator. So we've got Maura Jenkins. She is a features uh, reporter for the Washington Post. So she covers food, the arts, environmentalism. Uh, many of you may have seen her article a few months ago about hitting a pandemic wall went viral. Um, and she is also a great friend. We had the opportunity to, to travel around Israel together. So um, I will go ahead and hand it over to Maura. Thank you. I'm so glad to be here with all of you today. Happy Earth Day to everyone. Um, and we have some really, really interesting panelists here, um, and I'm happy to introduce them. So um, Rachel Pachivas is the COO of Anne-Marie Skincare, a luxury line of conscious botanical skincare. They handcraft herb-infused products made with organic and wildcrafted ingredients that promise beautiful glowing skin. As you can see, <laughs> your makeup is so great today. I love it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and next we have Ahmed Rahim. He is the co-founder and chief visionary officer of Numi Organic Tea. Numi makes organic and fair trade teas, shots, and drinking chocolates made with pure ingredients that create lasting positive in fact for the planet. And last we have Caroline Duell, who is the founder and CEO of All Good based in Morro Bay, California. All Good makes a line of premium organic body care products and mineral sunscreens. And so I'm, I'm so glad to meet all of you, first of all, um, and I'm glad that we're all here together on Earth Day. And I know that all of your businesses have really interesting origin stories. So I would love to start with just telling the group a little bit about how you got your start and the role that sustainability played in your company's founding. So actually, let's start with Caroline, if that's okay. Sure. Hi, everybody. And hi, fellow panelists. I love you guys. I'm so happy to be here all together on Earth Day. Um, yeah, so our origin story starts probably about eight years before the company actually started. And my company was started by uh, the plant people. And my job was really just to listen and observe and learn from the plants as we turned it into a business. And the truth to that is that I was living and working on an organic farm in the late 90s out in West Marin, just north of San Francisco. And, I, and she really wanted just a centerpiece of the land to be a beautiful place where all the medicinal herbs grow. And with a background of botanical and emergency medicine, I had a combination of, um, of, of an appreciation for harnessing nature as a tool for healing and particularly plants. Um, and I decided that with that garden to do it, to design it in, um, in areas of modalities. So I had a stomach section, a headache section, a, um, you know, skin section, and on and on. And the skin section just took off. Like one of my philosophies in gardening and farming is just to really watch what works and continue to support that. And so I developed this idea that if the plants that were companions in the, on the land and in the garden worked well together, that they would also create a synergistic relationship and a formula. And so I watched as some of the plants that I had intended to grow there died off. And then the ones that thrive were um, calendula, lavender, yarrow, plantain, and comfrey. And they were just, they were beautiful. And so I put them into a salve 
And I started giving it away to people and selling it at farmers markets locally. I had three jobs at the time. One was working at that farm. One was guiding rock climbing in the Sierras and another was working as a massage therapist. And so I just took that salve. I immediately called it all good goop. No intention of business at all. It was purely a hobby. It was purely the plant speaking to me to share with people. And so, um, yeah, I shared it, shared it around and uh, sold it at farmer's markets, literally just for fun. And then I just started watching the impact it had on people and how I just was so humbly, humbly greeted by pretty amazing results for what this salve was doing. And so um, I was always a, a rebel by nature and I thought business was kind of like the creation of all of our problems, not the solution. And I resisted the idea of business. So never was it gonna be a business. The next chapter is that we moved from West Marin, bought a junkyard to turn it into a permaculture center down in the central coast of California on unceded Chumash people's territory. And, um, and down there, I started getting calls from people up north saying like, you can't just not have all good goop, we need it. And so at that point, I recognized that there was a responsibility that I had to actually take everyday toxins and turn them into everyday healing. And um, that's really the origin of, of all good. And um, it was an eight year process from turning it into a hobby in the nineties to starting a business in 2006. And as far as sustainability goes, my resistance to business is really where the sustainability story is because I never believed that there was a way to scale a business without compromising values. And so from the, from the very first day that I sort of recognized and admitted it was gonna turn into a business, I felt committed to um, having environmental and social responsibility in the DNA of the company. That's amazing. Thanks, Caroline. Mm -hmm. Ahmed, how about you? Tell me about how you got your start. Thanks, Mara. Um, so yeah, my sister and I, we're, um, we started uh, NUMI about 20 years ago, and we, uh, we come from Baghdad, Iraq, where um, tea in the Middle East is, is highly drunk. And I and both of us uh, grew up as immigrants here in the United States, um, always drinking tea, and we always drank this dry desert lime. Um, and this dry desert lime is our drink of hospitality in Iraq. Like you go to Morocco and you drink mint uh, with green tea, or you go to China and everywhere you go, you drink green tea or um, you know, different places, they have their drink of hospitality, yerba mate in South America. So in our home culture, um, uh, this dry desert lime, which is called Numi, Numi means citrus in Arabic. So we named the company after this. And my sister and I both grew up uh, as artists and I was living in Europe for about 10 years and I opened up tea houses there. And I was really fortunate to uh, live a very beautiful bohemian life nothing like the business world i've entered into now and as an artist i um, opened these tea houses uh, with more the edge of creativity and and the romance and the poetry of tea and then my sister was also studying art in europe and in the us and in 99 we decided to come together she was living in oakland california and i had only heard of Oakland as this mysterious place. Um, and I always thought if I ever came back to the United States, I would come to California. And, and so we launched NUMI um, with this dry desert lime as our sort of flagship. And it still remains 20 years later, a flagship for us. And we introduced all kinds of other unique herbs to the market like roebus and honeybush and and, and that had never been really introduced to this marketplace. And we, we kept our, our innovation as a, a, a flagship. We introduced puer and turmeric and all kinds of other medicinal herbs. And, um, you know, all with the foundation of real ingredients. Um, a lot of teas on the market are adulterated with all kinds of natural and artificial flavorings and oils. So we really took this, um, this positioning of how do you keep nature as as intact as possible and how do you just pick the leaf or pick the herb or pick the spice and just um, enjoy it rather than having to put all kinds of flavorings in it which is in the majority of what we see on the market and also we wanted to really bring the high quality of what a full leaf type of tea is like 
And we infused all of that with creativity, with poetry, with recipes, with paintings. My sister and I got a little, little too um, artistic, I should say, even though it was a lot of fun and it, it's what fueled our, um, fueled our cup every day was the creativity that we were able to bring into each, each box and each bag of tea. Um, and of course, the foundation was all based on sustainable values, which I'm so sure we'll speak about a bit more. Um, and so today, 20 years later, we've branched off into all kinds of other products, medicinal teas and drinking chocolates and daily super shots, all with the basis of wellness and how do we regenerate ourselves and regenerate the planet and people along the way. I love that art is a part of your story. I think that's so cool. <laughs> um, so Rachel, tell us a little bit about Anne-Marie. Yeah, thanks, Mara. And I had no idea of those stories. That's amazing. I love both of them. <laughs> um, so yeah, Kevin and Anne-Marie Gianni, co-founders and owners of Anne-Marie Skincare, husband and wife, they had a video blog called Renegade Health, and they were traveling all around the country kind of just like talking about, you know, health and wellness and the best practices and best, best uh, tips and tricks that people can use for health and wellness. And they started getting the question, what skincare do they use or do they recommend? And they really couldn't recommend something that they had. And they started looking for a skincare line. And this was in 2008. They started looking for a skincare line that they felt confident they can recommend. And that was upheld to their values and clean and pure. And there really was nothing out there that they felt confident about. So then they started searching for a formulator and they're like, we're gonna just make a product line because there's nothing out here. And that wasn't the intention in the beginning. They really just wanted to recommend something. And then they went to a spa and tried this product line and Anne-Marie describes it as like the most magical experience she's ever had where there's herbs infused into these products and the smell and the texture and the results and everything about it was so amazing and so she connected with the formulator and partnered with her and then Anne Marie skincare was born and so it's to me it's fascinating that they didn't ever think oh we need a company the intention was just to provide a solution to their followers which is really amazing and unique and I met Kevin and Anne Marie shortly as they started uh, doing activist work where they were volunteers and I was working on a campaign here in California and that kind of brought us together and made us friends and we started working with them. So I feel like activism is such a strong part of our core and our mission and creating products that are pure and clean and real and utilizing plant medicine and herbs to their fullest degree uh, and putting that into a line of skincare products that are high-end luxury products uh, is kind of the essence of it. Great, great, yeah. Um, so one thing that I would love to kind of dissect with all of you is that there can sometimes be this perception that companies have to make trade-offs between doing well and doing good. Um, and so I'm wondering, first of all, has, has this been the case for you? Um, and maybe, you know, you could kind of unpack that a little bit. Uh, let's start with Ahmed. Yeah, so I mean, you know, there are compromises you make in business for sure. It's um, there isn't a straight line in anything in life, and nature has no straight lines. And I think we are uh, biomimicry of nature and how we have to be flexible and adapt to the business environment based on what our needs are and what our capabilities and the resources we have. And um, and for us, you know, it's been quite a journey in running one of the largest organic fair trade tea brands around the world and here in North America of how do we stay as committed to our values as possible. And there have been many points in the road that um, zigzag around how can we create the most sustainable product. Um, and with packaging, that was one that really has been um, it has been the hallmark of how can we really create everything um, so that the consumer doesn't have to have any responsibility in what they're doing with our product. Because I firmly believe that all manufacturers are responsible for everything that we put in and put out in the world. And um, so our packaging um, for our overwrap, you know, the tea bags go in a little overwrap. And it was at the time a 10, 
12 years ago, because it was a mission of ours for the last 15 years to create a compostable plant-based overwrap that's non-petroleum and non-GMO. And back then there was no demand and there were very few resources from manufacturers that make that kind of material. And the limited amount of manufacturers that we found, the price was over four times um, what we were paying which would have brought our cost into the millions um, for this uh, overwrap. So we couldn't do it um, because it was just, it, 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 we couldn't, it was just didn't make business sense. Um, the sustainability made complete sense. So if I fast forward to 2019 and 2020, the demand has grown. The manufacturers have, have, um, have really stepped up for that, um, that demand. And we were able to launch finally our compostable non-GMO plant-based overwrap. And, um, and that was one of those do good, but wait till the time is right. And, um, and the sacrifices you do make, hopefully they're very few. Um, and those that you make, it has a pure business sense. So that was one of ours. There's so many more, but uh, that's just one little example. Hard to be ahead of the curve. <laughs> Um, you know, it sounds like there are other times for, for all of you where you've experienced this, where some of your best laid plans don't work out and you have to make those compromises. And Rachel, I know that was the case for you guys as well. Tell me a little bit about what happened there um, and what did you learn from it too? Yeah, it's interesting. Packaging is such a huge thing and you have such high intentions for what you want to do. And I think to Ahmed's point, you know, you have this amazing product and you, you have to put it in amazing packaging because you want to think of the full cycle. And so us, we wanted to, so I met this guy who created these hemp and sugar cane based labels that completely, completely were biodegradable. And they, he took a minute and after about four years, he finally had them available at a decent price. So I was like, yes, we have to do it. We have to do it. And so we switched our labels to using these uh, sugar cane based biodegradable. So not just compostable, but they will actually biodegrade off the bottle probably about 30 to 45 days. And I was so excited to get rid of just anything, you know, just go the deepest we can. And so we launched it without testing with our customers and people were not happy about it. They didn't love the idea that their product sat on their counter for three months. And after a month or two, it started fading away. Um, you know, so it, it kind of taught me just, we have to think about, I mean, first, I think there's a whole piece of education that we could continue doing to help people understand the packaging industry and toxic mylar labels with the toxic adhesives and toxic inks and the whole picture and how we want to take a step back and think of what the next best thing is. And then maybe eventually we can get to biodegradable labels. So it we kind of took a, a middle ground road and we went with compostable with non-toxic adhesives and non-toxic inks. And we're still doing good, but we're not doing exactly what I wanted to do in the beginning, which was a lesson learned. <laughs> what do you think it will take for people to accept those kinds of labels? I don't know. I think, I mean, maybe the bigger picture of like, where does all this go? Do we look at the ocean? Do we start looking at where is all of this waste going and how much of it is going there per year? And does, does that matter enough for us to make that decision to be okay if the label doesn't look immaculate after a month or two? For me, I personally am like, yeah, that's great. Look, let's give it to me. Uh, but I think because I'm like down the rabbit hole a little bit more. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Caroline, um, I know that some of your choices that you've made with sustainability in mind um, ended up helping you in other areas of your business as well, um, especially in this past year. Is that right? I'm wondering, you know, how how has that impacted you throughout the last year when a lot of businesses have been have been struggling? Well, it's always a nice story when making the right choice actually ends up in, in a similarly positive result, right? And I think that's so much of this and making social and environmentally aware decisions, packaging or any of these things that we're talking about is, um, is when it all lines up, right? And, and, you can, and you can actually roll with it and actually make it happen. Um, it's, it, that's, that's when it all starts to make sense. It has to make business sense, has to make environmental sense as well. Um, and so a couple of principles I thought of and just what Rachel and Ahmed were talking about is um, thoughtful consideration, right? So that's one of, uh, that's a really big one for us and it's been through and through. 
And so we built our business through collaboration and thoughtful consideration. And, and so much of that is, is about who we do business with and who we, you know, um, where our money spends the night, where, um, where we source our ingredients, where we source our packaging. And um, relative to COVID to last year, one of the things that happened for us was that, I mean, we all remember, right? 13 months ago, we just froze and all looked at each other and we were like, what are we going to do? How are we going to get out of this? Having a community of people of collaboration around us to sort those ideas and, and uh, concerns out was hugely helpful. And one of the things that we reflected on from that was just that decisions that we had made years prior were the right decisions, not only because we were doing them out of thoughtful consideration, but because in the end, they were gonna support us in this crisis. A couple of those decisions were, um, we've been committed to sourcing domestic packaging. Um, so we were able to get components for things that we needed. Um, Rachel and I collaborate on, on packaging when you can't get it domestically. Uh, and the, those were, there were some, it was almost impossible, right? So, so domestic packaging, a choice made out of a, a carbon, uh, you know, a, a carbon impact uh, question ended up being a good business choice. Another one was that um, our lender um, is RSF Social Finance, an amazing nonprofit introduced to us by Ahmed um, and a few others. And, uh, and those guys just are embedded in what matters to us as people and how we're gonna have an impact on our surroundings as well as people. They cared, they stepped up to the plate with for us. Um, another one is our bank where our money spends the night is Beneficial State Bank, a B Corp bank. Um, and we were first in line in our county for the PPP loans because Beneficial State Bank was our partner in that and we were working together in that. So that was a decision that we had made years ago out of a consciousness of wanting to work with like-minded people who care. And then in the end, guess what? That's who you want on your boat when you're in a storm, right? Is the, 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 those who, uh, who are going to take care of each other and understand how to navigate um, kind of the chaos. So, yeah. And all of that enabled you to get um, hand sanitizer going when it was especially needed, right? Tell me a little bit more about that. That's right. And that's another piece on sourcing was that, you know, we make a plant-based, domestically plant-based uh, hand sanitizer, mostly organic ingredients. And guess what? All the petroleum-based raw materials were completely out of stock. So nobody could get anything. Um, and um, once again, you know, our, uh, our choice to, to do that for for reasons of what we believe in ended up helping us result in, um, in being able to make hand sanitizer. So yeah, we scaled our hand sanitizer. And we were able to supply it in the crisis. Um, immediately for healthcare workers and school districts and, um, and uh, I mean, you know, governments, agencies, municipalities. And then in the end of the year, we were able to, um, to donate it to where we're, I, we identified where there was a huge need, um, a discrepancy in where resources had not been given. And um, we gave uh, millions of ounces to tribal nations across the, the country, as well as food banks um, and healthcare um, workers. So. That's um, amazing. Yeah, so thanks. Great. You know, I'm also wondering, as someone who has covered COVID and its impact on businesses for the last year or two, um, you know, how, what about you, Rachel and Ahmed? How, how has COVID impacted your business? Um, tell me, let's start with Rachel. Um, yeah, hugely. So we definitely, when it happened, we knew we were going to be, I mean, we're a luxury skincare line and we're not necessity, although I think luxury skincare is a necessity and clean skincare, <laughs> but not everybody thinks that way. And that's understandable. And so we saw some changes, I think, you know, with our language, we had to be more mindful. So we have a lot of face masks, like hydrating, moisturizing masks. And if we say, get a mask, there was this constant thought process of masks, not the masks that we think of. So we had to adjust and we thought about, you know, what people wanted to see. And so we put out actually a work from home guide because we were a remote company and a lot of companies were not 
And we're like, well, let's just send this out to the world. And so we kind of took steps like that to think like what people don't really want skincare right now. Like how can we be a support to people in just a general way? And so the work from home guide was helpful. We put out like a self-care guide. We tried to just communicate in a different way where we're obviously empathetic of what's going on because we were all experiencing it. Uh, but it definitely impacted our business and made us think a little bit differently in that way. Mm -hmm. How about you, Ahmed? How did you have to pivot over the last year? What, what kinds of changes did you make? Yeah, I just thought, Rachel, of a Zoom skincare line. <laughs> it's something Love just it. for Zoom. Yeah. <laughs> um, so COVID, yeah, I mean, I think COVID has definitely shifted patterns. We have obviously no longer are in an office, and I don't know how that office environment is going to even reshape itself. Um, I think people have really gotten accustomed and acclimated to working from home. And it's difficult with continuing to build team culture and team morale. Um, but you know, our CEO, Brian, and the rest of the management and executives and directors have done a fantastic job of really keeping the threads entwined of what unites us as a company and as in our mission and in our culture. Um, and the values of our business are so strong that I think that just webs across into um, all the stakeholders. But I do think on the business side, it, it, the challenge for us was um, our food service business. It is a, a, about a quarter of our business. And that went pretty dormant. You know, we're in hundreds and hundreds of different um, operators, you know, whether it's the tech offices like the Googles and Facebooks and Apples and all those that serve NUMI or the universities or the, you know, cheesecake factories. And, and um, it's just, it's endless the amount of food service we do because um, there are just so many small little operators and chains that we work with um, that basically shut down for a good part of last year. And so that a lot need, made, gave us the need to really shift our focus and how do we um, strategize in other channels and how do we um, uh, shift the team's focus into what matters most and what is really generating the revenue and, um, and, and adhering to our values. So we had to pivot a few times you know, during the year and you know, redoing the budgets and all kinds of little things like that. Um, and partnering with our, you know, uh, various financial institutions that were supporting us during the during the tough mo months of last summer, um, because in general summer is slower for um, a hot tea beverage brand. People are probably drinking more cold beverages and or even alcohol. Um, so tea, hot tea, is not the biggest consum consumed product in the summer months. So we we have we had a little bit of a double whammy um, last summer. But you know we're seeing things shift and and pick back up in that food service hospitality world. Um, and luckily, a lot of our business last year with the online and retail continued to grow quite healthy. And um, so that that made up for some of the difference. Um, and I just think overall, I just think it's it's just been this shift in mindset of of how do we put our best focus um, in this remote world where we're not able to see customers, we're not able to go see brokers, we're not able to see one another. Um, how do we really just show up? And it's been really amazing to just hold space and um, allow people to go through what they need to go through. And I think that's opened up a whole new channel of culture and of acceptance of just our good days and our maybe not so good days. Yeah, that's very compassionate too. <laughs> um, so, so for the whole group now, um, I'm wondering how has being a sustainable business been advantageous for you in, in other ways? You know, what are some ways in which having this mission has helped you scale? Um, so let's, let's go to Caroline for that. Well, kind of like I said, it, I, I never really saw it as, I never really saw another option. So um, I, I wasn't interested in an in extractive, destructive business that just kept perpetuating the way things have gone with pollution and, and um, in the world. And so um, from the beginning, I think, I mean, a very, if you take it down to brass tacks, it's like the idea of creating a business where you're actually going to, you know, regenerate the sources of where you get things and uh, not perpetuate that old industrial way of doing things 
is a, is a good business plan, right? Because it's going to keep us all alive longer and all in business longer. So I would just say, I would say that it, you know, not to dodge the question, but it really has just served us in every way because it's who we are and it's what sort of um, allows us to exist in that sense. Um, yeah, I think that's it. And I'll add one other piece in here, uh, which is just throughout our entire um, entire time in business. And, and it's been an incredible um, experience in that way. Um, from day one, when I realized we were starting a business, uh, we joined 1% for the planet because I knew that I would have a commitment to, to giving back, but I wanted to have a, a community collaboration in that. And I wanted to have a kind of a communication stamp a commitment of, so we give 1% of our revenues to nonprofit environmental um, organizations. And then um, in the same way, a few years later, I watched it, I tracked it. I watched some of the, uh, um, you know, the OGs join this organization called, um, or become certified B Corp. Um, in 2009, we became a certified B Corp. And once again, it was an external accountability thing. Um, so for us to be able to have this measurable, uh, non-diluting way to uh, have a, a mirror against our uh, environmental and social practices internally. And then progressing that along, um, just this year, we became climate neutral certified. So we've achieved carbon neutrality through measurement reduction and um, offsetting our carbon emissions. Um, and then, you know, I would say one thing that really brings all of that together is um, is our membership in OSC, which is an organization that Ahmed co-founded um, One Step Closer. And all of those to me are one step closer, one step closer to an organic sustainable community is the original idea, but you can fill in the blank because it's to a thriving living system where we're all understanding the interdependence and interrelationship of um, the importance of relying on one another and, and taking care of our surroundings along the way and each other. Um, so yeah, it's who we are. That's great. Thanks, Caroline. Rachel, what about you? Um, how has being a sustainable business been advantageous for Anne-Marie? Ben, that was the origin of the company. And so I think we've, um, I think people are really looking for that. I think people, especially now, I think over the past 10 years, there's been this awakening where people are really starting to pay attention to ingredients and harmful chemicals. Mm -hmm. Uh, and looking at how it's affecting their daily lives. And so I think that being a brand and being a company and providing a product that is definitely that, it makes it very easy for them. And so another thing is, you know, being involved with different coalitions for legislation to adjust the skincare uh, legislation and cosmetics legislation. Um, and then also our products being made safe verified, which is a third party verification program that is really screening for a ton of different chemicals, chemicals combined, uh, pesticide residue, GMOs, anything that causes any sort of endocrine disruption or developmental disruption. And they're doing this full intensive screening. And I knew Amy through uh, the campaign labeling GMOs. And we were like, yeah, just verify our products. And there was nothing needed to do. So it was like a simple step for them. And we were the first skincare line to be verified. And now it's just completely blown up and everybody's really looking for that and people are really aware of that and so it's really great to be kind of on those starting lines of um, what people are searching for so i think you know to caroline's point just being true to who your brand is and being a clean brand has allowed us to be recognized by people and appreciated by people yeah legislation wise is there anything that should be on our radar since you brought that up yeah so there there was a bill that passed recently for fragrance, so disclosure of fragrance. So there's a few different things um, constantly happening to reform the Cosmetics Act that was passed in the 70s. And as we all know, there's been tons and tons of tons of chemicals that have been have put on the market since then without any sort of approval or uh, regulation. And so there's a reform to look into that and make it better. Uh, there's, it's still a little stagnant and like all bills, I think they get watered down. So I would just be cautious of that. But the one that did pass the Fragrance Act was to disclose fragrances. So I don't know if people know, but there's a loophole with fragrances that was passed back in uh, the 60s or the 70s so that fragrance house companies didn't have to disclose their ingredients. 
but what that did is made it so that no ingredient had to be disclosed and no chemical had to be disclosed. So there's tons of phthalates and um, endocrine disruptors and really bad ingredients housed as fragrance. And so now there is happening, they're gonna have to do some sort of disclosure. So I don't know the specifics on what that looks like, but I know that that passed recently last year, which is great. So great, yeah, yeah. thanks for letting us know, yeah. yeah. Ahmed, what about you? How um, has being a sustainable business helped you scale? Well, more importantly, it has helped this planet and all the people we work with scale. Um, so we look at every stakeholder and, and every um, element in which we produce, and it's our north, north, northern star, and it's our guiding light of why we do business and why we wake up every day. Um, we work with over 15,000 farmers and their families, and <clears throat> these are some of the poorest countries in the world. Um, a lot of indigenous cultures that don't have the basic things that we have, whether it's clean water, um, whether it's education, healthcare, uh, just the things that we need to just be in full balance. And so I think it's helped us really by helping them and they help us because without them, we would have nothing. They are the supply chain. They are the source. Um, the same with this, this planet. Um, without regenerating this planet, we won't have a planet one day. So it's only helped us because um, we know that we have to commit truly to where everything comes from and, and who are the sources. And I think to what Rachel was saying, I think consumer demand is shifting and changing. We obviously have to also help create that new perception um, I don't think that perception is always there. And, you know, we're still talking about a small percentage. Organic is 8% of con consumption today. So it's still a very small percentage. Um, and, but it is shifting and the, the waves are moving. Um, the global warming, look at what Biden just made a commitment yet, yes, yesterday, 50%, um, uh, you know, reduction by 2030. And um, these are big, bold moves that, the, 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 the largest economy in the world's making and small companies like us are making. But it, it is that movement that I think is creating awareness and that demand is, is now shifting. And we, you know, we launched the first fair labor practices program, our own fair trade practice um, that we work directly with far, farmers. It's, it's not a pass fail, it's an, it's an improvement program that allows farmers to um, get better each year at how they take care of one another. Um, we, we rejected the non-GMO uh, verified because they were certifying uh, brands that were using those see-through tea bags that are all made of GMO corn or, or petroleum. And we said, how can you allow a, a tea bag that is, is a GMO product to be verified when you're putting it in boiling water? And they actually agreed and they said, you're right, that's it. That, that becomes an ingredient. So we, we finally became that, but, but you know, we, we just took bold moves in how we really um, put a line in the sand of what we um, will approve and what we won't, what, what we don't want to be a part of. Um, and I think that has continued, you know, like, like Caroline, we are also c carbon neutral. Um, you know, we, 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 we only do plant-based packaging. Everything of ours is all organic and fair trade. So we just try not to bend the rules of, of our values and um, because it really benefits all of those that bring it to us. Yeah. So I see we have a ton of questions in the Q&A. So I'm going to hop over there. Um, and let's start with, so Dan V is asking, have you had an intentional value and or social stance result in being a poor business choice? And did you ever make a change to how you do business for better financial value and regret it or have feedback that caused you to rethink the choice. Is there anyone who has a, um, an answer for that? Can you repeat it fully? Sorry. Sure, sorry. Basically what he is asking is um, if, if you've ever made a decision um, that, that you made for, for financial reasons that you regret it or that you had feedback that caused you to rethink the choice. Tough question. <laughs> No one. We can move on if no one has a good answer. I'll I'll I'll, I'll um I'll chime in. Um, <clears throat> I think it's doing too much, 
And I would say do less and do less better. Um, and we probably at the beginning of our business probably launched too many products, which scattered um, our resources, scattered our people. Um, and we grew in so many channels really quickly. We grew into many channels of, of internet and e-commerce and food service and international and retail and gourmet and specialty and I don't know, department stores. And you know we grew really fast when we launched. So we just had all this demand and all these products that you have to maintain inventory for. So financially, it's a big undertaking when you're launching a new company and um, the demand is so big and you have so many different things to 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 keep in your in your supply chain and inventory and if i were to look back i would do less and do less more makes sense yeah i'll just add one comment onto that which is a you know i think more of a trend not necessarily a story but i find that it's both financially and environmentally more responsible when forecasting works well and it's not like a uh, <laughs> it's not like a sexy part of the business to talk about. But if you're coming in, I remember the day, the first early days of Expo West, when we'd get down there and we'd be like, "Oh, we forgot this and we forgot that," and it's like, you know, you run out to the stores and just buy virgin paper printed on whatever and something from Target to fill your booth, and you know, it's like if we planned and just thought about it ahead of time, we, you save money and then you get what you want. Um, and that is, uh, that's for us deeply rooted in everything we do. We have our own farm where we grow some of the raw materials that go into our products. And that's a constant uh, kind of thing that we keep having to come back to is like financially, you have to decide and plan a whole season ahead and how then that's going to actually fold into the products. So ultimately I find them to actually be pretty well aligned and it comes back to planning. Planning is a good lesson for any business, I suppose. <laughs> so our next question is from Jean. Um, Jean is asking, will you scale back up differently with supply chain partners? Do you need to establish new alternative sources given the migratory aspect of the pandemic and the double whammy of climate change impact? Is there anyone who wants to talk about their supply chain partners? I'm happy to. Um, yeah, so we actually source Myron Glass, which is uh, from the Netherlands. And we haven't had any problem with that, thankfully. And then we get a lot of all of our other materials from the US. And luckily we've also had a, an okay uh, situation with them. We have made the decision this year or last year when everything happened to, we had samples and smaller things. And you know we would try to provide samples and travels and different sizes for everybody so they can experience the products. And we just realized it's so much waste and it's, they could just purchase the full size and if they don't like it, we'll refund them. Uh, so instead of purchasing all of these different packages from overseas, we wanted to kind of hone in and bring everything domestic and also just really focus on how far things are coming from. Um, but in terms of packaging and supply chain in general, we, as soon as COVID happened, we sent our projections to them. Instead of, typically we have a three month turn rate we forecasted six months so that we were prepared in case there was any sort of delay uh, and then just adjusting as needed based on demand and based on uh, sales and trends. Anyone else want to talk about their, um, their supply chain partners? Yeah, I'll share a little, you know, because we source from over 35 countries, there's going to be climate issues in, in so many countries in South Africa where we source herbs. They've had droughts in, in, I mean, there's been hurricanes and tsunamis in some of our, um, where there's too much rain. I mean, there's been all kinds of, of the, the way the climate is working right now. It's, it's so unpredictable and global warming is at our doorstep. And um, so we have to be very, at, at, at our company, very nimble. And um, to what Caroline was mentioning, like with forecast, we have to think far in advance with, with inventory and raw materials. Um, and during COVID, you know, we did have a lot of issues because we source a lot from China, especially green teas. And, you know, we were pretty much we just had no inventory because they were first hit with COVID. And, um, and so they were, and then they had their big, you know, lunar holiday. 
and right at the at the at, in the middle of COVID. So yeah, we were just out of inventory, and yet we had bought luckily enough to keep us through a certain period. But you know, I think the global warming. I don't. I don't think the COVID um, uh, challenges are any more prominent right now. Although in India, it's growing so heavily. Uh, I was thinking about that last night, how that can affect us with the surge going in India right now. Um, I do think the global warming issue is the bigger one, that it's going to pose potentially challenges, obviously, that we don't even see right now, but how can we be proactive and thinking about that? And we do think through that and, and say, what if um, we have these, these similar challenges like we've had before? Where is our backup? Where is our alternative? Can we grow stuff domestically? Um, so some things don't grow as well domestically as they grow in these, uh, you know, different indigenous cultures. But it's it's a great point, and it's one that I think all companies and brands should be thinking about. I just wanted to add to that. I definitely wasn't even thinking of ingredients in that supply chain. It's horrific to see the changes, and what we've had to do is create. Kind of a spreadsheet with our backup sources and backup farms. Um, we had our helichrysum and just one year there was a complete drought and they couldn't get anything. And so I think it's essential to have to pivot and shift, but it is a little bit scary thinking of how prices are surging based on these problems and finding backups. Definitely. That's what I was going to say is we're seeing a, a increased costs across all supply chains. Uh, everything is increasing in cost, and I have yet to see the tolerance of the of the consumer re, uh, receiving a price increase. So, um, you know, just sort of a little business to business on that is interesting for us. So, actually, it's a great seg to another question here, um, which is someone who's asking a lot of choices to sorry a lot of choices to enhance sustainability can also substantially increase costs. From a marketing perspective, how do you effectively communicate the price point of ethical products? Do you find that consumers need this education component before making purchase decisions? I can go. <laughs> yeah, go for it. Uh, I think, I think education is a huge piece of it. Um, you know, we've started looking at some of our sourcing for ingredients and our farmers and manufacturers and where we want to source these from. And some of them are more expensive. And so we've started doing ingredient spotlights and storytelling and telling like very specific stories on what they're getting. And I think if they can build that connection with these sources, I feel like they'll be more inclined to support it and be on board with it and understand the price. But I, I think educa education is huge factor in somebody understanding the full cycle um, and then also the education on if you don't support that full cycle what that looks like for the planet so yeah this is a major one for us is uh in the sunscreen market we make mineral sunscreens and the biggest educational issue is that the experience of a mineral sunscreen is nothing like what everybody's been used to for their entire life of using chemical sunscreens so um, that's, a, that's, that's an always sort of challenge and, and an interesting um, puzzle for us is how do you communicate that on the shelf? Um, and you really can't, you know? So we do tons of adv advocacy and education around um, mineral sunscreens and just basically trying to offer people the idea that, um, you know, kind of eliminate your choice of the one that is taking a, a shower in chemicals and, um, and, and choose the other, but it's gonna be more expensive. There's no way around that, so. Well, whoever asked that question, you're asking the million dollar, 60,000 pound gorilla in the room question. <laughs> um, every premium brand is their biggest obstacle, is how do you educate consumers? Um, when you're such a premium brand, and you're higher priced because of all that you put in the product from your quality to your ingredients to your fair trade and organic and sustainable and the list goes on and on and on you're going to be reflected as a higher price um, so if you find out the answer please let us know because it's an ongoing um uh, it is it's it's what separates us from the rest of the um the companies and, and brands on the shelf and educating consumers and educating everyone to be activated to make the right choice, um, both to what Rachel said, both for the good and the consequences of the bad. 
is 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 really what hopefully should drive our choices um so please help us we need help <laughs> so um here's a question from the young mountain team um and it's a pretty big question which is uh they are curious to hear everyone's thoughts on the next frontier of sustainability um they have gone from organic to regenerative ag recently and they're wondering um what comes next so let's start with caroline did i put you on the spot sorry <laughs> what comes next i mean i think we're all in it together we're all discovering what comes next together uh i'll tell you one thing that I really hope we move beyond is um, is just the the sort of posturing in the language and getting caught in the language of things rather than understanding the substantive practices behind that. Um, and that is something that frankly concerns me with the idea of regenerative. Um, my husband and I have been in the organic farming movement for 20 plus years and um, and there's so much to it and, and and it just breaks our heart that if there were ever compromises made, and then that compromise was actually something that perpetuated a different movement that you know didn't continue to take into account the idea of truly building soil and not using chemicals and all the things that organic has always stood for that at the same time it has gotten watered down so it's very complicated um yeah i mean what comes next is just a continuation of transparency and of um of really collaborative, collaboratively finding solutions that um, that I think um, businesses can take responsibility for, and then consumers can can, try, can just continue to trust. That's a that's a big piece of it for me. Um, yeah, I would just say what comes next. It's collaboration, and you know, um, as Caroline mentioned earlier, uh, I'm. I, I'm really honored to have started an organization called One Step Closer. You can look it up at osc2.org. And it's really bringing some of the, the leading sustainable brands together to really think uh, bigger than in our own ways as an organization, um, but really through the group intention of how do we do more together and do it more impactfully. So I think collaboration um, through our work is, we have the Climate Collaborative, which gives nine areas of commitments. We have the packaging collaborative, which um, is really working together to create sustainable um, plant-based packaging. And last year we launched JEDI around justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion, which is a big theme in our industry since it's predominantly um, a white Caucasian industry. Um, you know, our climate collaborative now has nine, 800 organizations that have joined. Packaging collaborative has over a hundred organizations. And, you know, these are big companies that have joined um, from the, the, the Pepsis to the Danons to the Unilevers to a lot of our brands in the OSC group, which is about 40 of us. Um, but I do think collaboration is, is by far the way we will start to um, awaken consciousness in what choices we make and thinking of what's next um, to beyond regenerative because regenerative is, is the cachet right now, but there will be more and more needs um, as we uh, as this planet evolves and as global warming takes hold. I love that. I, I feel like I completely agree with the collaboration piece. Um, I think if you are a brand who has, we're an e-com company, so we have this platform where we can speak to a lot of customers through an email. And if I think if there's brands out there who have opportunities to support like-minded brands and small brands and brands doing good by the planet, I think take that as an opportunity to really support them. Um, we support other skincare brands uh, just in other products as well. And I think some people are stunned by that. And I think there's no competition in that sense if we're supporting something that is on the same page as us and have, has the same values as us. Uh, I think the more toxic chemicals we get off the shelves, the better. And yeah, I think if anybody can do that too. Great, yeah. And so um, one more question we've had from Mike. I know we are running out of time. Um, Mike is wondering, can you tell us where we can find these products at retail? So I'd love for everyone to just go around and say where we can buy all the products you've been working on. So we're not in, re we're not in many retail stores. <laughs> we're an online company. So our website is annemariegiani.com. And that's A-N-N-M-A-R-I-E-G-I-A-N-N-I.com.
Well, we're at allgoodproducts.com, <laughs> but we're in, mostly in retailers. <laughs> um, go to the website. It's a great place. And the retailers we also love are um, many different independent natural health food stores, many different independent outdoor stores. So any small town that has a ski shop and a health food store or a climbing shop and a health food store, we're probably in both of them. And then um, some of the bigger retailers, um, we, mo we work with this small boutique um, online store called Amazon. Uh, and then uh, we, work in, we work with Target and um, Thrive Market, a handful of other retailers as well. And uh, you can find Numi um, also online at numit.com and Amazon, as well as all, a lot of the smaller um, online stores. In retail, you can find it at Whole Foods and Sprouts and Safeway and Kroger's and most of the natural food stores around the country. And, and um, yeah, depends where you are. We have an online um, portal where you can enter your zip code at numit.com and maybe there'll be a store right around the corner from you. Great. Thanks, everyone. I know we are out of time. I just wanted to say thank you all. This was so inspiring. I think somebody put it in the chat of just like such inspirational leaders has given them hope for the future of our planet. Um, and thank you, Maura, for an amazing moderation job. Those were such insightful questions. So, thank you. Everyone. Happy birthday, everybody. Thanks again yeah. for joining us. Thanks Thank so much, you. everyone. Thank you, Mara. Happy Thank Earth Thank you all. Thank, Thank you, you all. Thanks, Karen.